We're back. The greatest interview of all time. I am pleased to welcome you all to this absolutely great mate conversation with the divinely inspired Uberboyo. And we will talk a bit about everything regarding Nietzsche, or perhaps not everything because it's a very big topic, but we'll get into some juicy stuff at least. So very welcome to this um, The Fine Channel, Steph. Thank you very much, my man. I'm um, delighted to be here and maybe we can uh, set the foundations for, I don't know, rebuilding the Longboat Army and seeing what we can do with that. So this is good stuff. The Nietzsche and Longboat Army might return. Yeah, I think that's the only reasonable course of action at uh, at this stage. So I thought we could get straight into it. I always like to sort of hear the origin story of uh, of commentators. So what sort of brought you to your um, your current worldview? I suppose Nietzsche has been a big part of it. So how did you get to, how did you find Nietzsche or how did the spirit of Nietzsche find you rather? Okay, fantastic. Well, I will dive into this now. Now I may go on a bit of a tirade, a bit of a rant. So stop me if you want to pull up any questions or if you want I to... I like rants, so it's all oh, good. Go okay, for it. <laughs> we're ready for it. I'm, I'm blazed out of my mind on coffee, so get ready. <laughs> so the origin story, the best place to start is, of course, college, because I, I think this is such a profound theme when you think about it. Like, what is the... Like you're you're a brilliant channel. You're you've got a brilliant brand because you're very orientated towards self improvement. You've built yourself a fantastic physique, and you are very positive, you. and you're always very optimistic. And you're like, lads, look, no matter what's going on in the world, you need to take control of your situation. And there's things you can do in yourself. And I actually really really like that. I've always liked your vibe because of this. Now, um, when I think back to my life, I always had an instinct inside of me that I knew I needed to improve. You know, like I think all guys have this on some level. And you feel like, you know, I'm not, I'm not good enough. I could be better. There's things I could do that is better. Now, the purpose of the education system is to help you fulfill that potential on its fundamental level. Like if you lived in ancient Rome or ancient Greece, they would have brought you in from a young age and taught you music and wrestling and turned you into a super warrior, an intelligent super warrior, so you can be of service to the tribe and the state, essentially. Now, when I went to college in Ireland... I go in and I, I'm entering into the education system. I'm a young dude. I'm a fucking dummy. I don't really know what's going on. <laughs> I don't know uh, how the world works. And so I'm kind of just going along with the plan an awful lot. Now, in secondary school, like I was going along with the plan. Secondary school isn't so bad. It was an awful lot of fun. It was like, you know, hanging out with the girls and um, making friends, playing sports. There was some education that was kind of boring, like all this type of stuff, but whatever about that. That was generally okay. It wasn't, uh, univers uh, high school was not that big of a deal, okay? But university was something else. So I remember getting into this and I studied literature. I studied English. I studied um, philosophy. I studied music. I studied sociology. These are the humanities, the liberal arts. You're hearing an awful lot about this stuff from America. And of course, like people yeah. like Jordan Peterson. So I go into these and I go in on my first couple of days and I'm introduced to this sort of set of ideas and all these thinkers and all these books. And I keep hearing this sort of motif where I'm getting this idea that we need to criticize something called the Western canon. Now, I have read some Shakespeare because I had a fantastic English teacher and I knew a, a vaguely what this Western canon was, but I, I didn't really understand what it was at all. But I was hearing an awful lot of this. And this is called actually critical theory. You might, you, you might recognize this these days as critical race theory, which is derivative mm. of this. Now, this is actually coming out of deconstructionism, postmodernism, all these type of things. But basically, this is, this is the kind of school of thought that's current in the colleges. I enter in and all these professors are saying, yeah, we must criticize this Western canon. And then um, we must deconstruct it and try to understand what was happening with this. And for example, there's this guy called Derrida, and he was saying that the Western canon is phallogocentric, which is really bad because it's male. It's <laughs> it's it's you know it's, it swings his dick around too much. It's logocentric, <laughs> which means it's too logical. Yeah. It's got this stiff Christian morality inside of it. And of course, I'd hear all this stuff, and you know, the world we grow up in, I'd be like, yeah, those fucking stiff Christians. Oh yeah, you know this this male nonsense. You know, we got a we're in a different world now because a bit of a lib when I was younger, mm. and then. Um, then there's these other things that are put in front of me. So I get give the I get given the Communist Manifesto, and I'm told that I need to learn Marxism so I can look into um, the Western canon and read the Western canon and understand the implicit capitalist propaganda inside Western canon and understand mm. the, the way that Marxism is inside of it. I go in and Judith Butler is presented to me. This is the foundation of what we understand now as queer theory and the idea that there's a heteronormative way, you know, like if you, there's a, there's a way that society programs you to be, Foucault, all of these characters. You've heard about them all. People call this generally cultural Marxism. None of that conceptual stuff I understood at, understood at this time. Instead, I was experiencing it very subjectively. I go into the university and I'm being told 
told there's this bad thing that needs to be critiqued. And mm. it's very intellectual and sophisticated, sophisticated to critique it properly. And something, nothing intellectual with me, but something in my gut feels that there's something off with this. I'm sitting there. I'm trying to be a diligent enough student. I'm kind of taking some drugs every now and again and partying a bit too much. But generally speaking, <laughs> I'm, I'm being diligent. Mm. I'm going in there. I'm, I'm listening to these theories, but there's something in my gut that's saying this isn't helping me. You know, I'm going in here and I'm having all these abstractions shoved down my throat. None of these people are good writers. They're very abstract, um, heavy writers that uh, use like an awful lot of conceptual jargon. We can maybe get into that later. And it's just not. It's it's not making me feel. Uh, I have got no thumos. You know, it's not like mm. I'm I'm feeling the my energy levels go up. Instead, I'm actually finding very subtly there's stuff like you know the. Judith Butler is blaming me, blaming masculinity. And I'm like, I'm a dude. Like, why mm. should I be reading this shit that's, that's putting me down and stuff like this? And so I decide that, all right, I'm learning all theory and I'm not learning any skills. I came in here because I want to improve. I want to become better. I need skills. And so I basically drop out on this predicate that I, I don't need theory. This is just nothing but theory. This is making me, this is turning me into a giant, like big head intellectual, like Dexter, but not making me any good. So I drop out and I pursue music. I pursue public speaking. I find like mentors in Dublin to help me do this stuff. I just start to pay them and go to classes with them and stuff like this. And I basically like invent my own private education program for myself. And it was very messy, but it was me going in that direction. And out of that, I, I found Nietzsche during that period in the university. And so as I was dropping out, I kind of said to myself, there must be something to this theory stuff. So I should read this Western canon thing. So I read a bit more about it to try to understand what it was. And I realized it was like Plato, uh, scholastics, the Christians, um, German philosophy, basically, and modern philosophy. And I said, well, fuck it. I could just get those books and read this shit myself. I don't need some idiot telling me how to deconstruct these things. So I went to the library and I picked up Plato and I was like reading Plato. I was like, my God, this is Plato is so clear. So elegant so straightforward in the way that he, he articulated himself and of course then i heard like all of philosophy is footnotes to plato i read through a lot of that and then i obviously came to nietzsche and nietzsche comes and young and all them and, and nietzsche comes up and he's you know the prophet of the lightning you know he's just you read him and he's just he bewitches you with how amazing he is as a writer he's just so compelling and i remember picking up zarathustra and i'm like oh my god this looks like an amazing the ubermensch like all these amazing vital forward thinking profound ideas affirming my my heroic instincts affirming yeah. this idea of fulfilling your potential and i'm like I'm, I'm like this is this this motherfucker speaking my language you know <laughs> this is exactly what i was looking for and it got yeah. me hyped and so I dropped out, set up this sort of private education program, went to do Mai Tai. This is actually like as I started Mai Tai about maybe a year or two later, Conor McGregor started to kick into gear and he started mm -hmm. to get his career in the ascendant. So this is kind of gives you an understanding of the time frame. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, this basically brought me into Nietzsche. I started to read him and I was doing this kind of private training and teaching English to make my cash and asking mum for like, you know, $40 every now and again so I could pay for like a music teacher or something like this. And that was my life for a while. And then Jordan Peterson comes along and starts to mainstream Nietzsche and Jung. And, and that was basically like, oh my God. Like I'd never heard anybody in popular culture speak about these two esoteric philosophers that I was like, you know, nerding out on. He starts yeah. talking about them and I'm like, yes, good fucking Lord. This is the best thing ever. And so I started a YouTube channel basically talking about that and it, it just kind of takes off from there. Um, so I was like writing on the back of Jordan Peterson to, to, to get my place in the, in the sun, if you will. And then um, that's kind of the, the very, very basic origin stories. And there's many sort of derivatives after that. All right. Awesome. Yeah, cool. So uh, you got red pilled by Jordan Peterson and then you transcended his levels of red pills, I, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, like... So, yeah, if we want to talk about the specific red pills. So at the time when I read Nietzsche first, he was talking about, I, I think this is really important to understand because at that level, I had very little concern about the nature of the world. I was very much focused on my own potential. I think a lot of, a lot of young dudes just want to become better. They want to become good enough. They like, you know, they want to get the girls. They want to be cool. They want to express their creativity. That was, these were the main concerns for me. Yeah. And I was listening to Nietzsche and and like, again, in college, I was having this, like I later understood it through Jordan Peterson as a project of actual demoralization, which is extremely pernicious and dangerous. That's taking away people's potential and turning them into like weapons of some ideology. But I, forget all that. What I felt inside of that was, was weakness. I was losing grips of my potential. And then I come across Nietzsche and he's like speaking of heroism and you can go and you can change your destiny and transform and Jung saying the same thing. This appeals to me an awful lot. And so I have this implicit sort of go for it, build, create attitude inside of me. But at that time, like, it's not like my worldview was well formed. I was sort of like, uh, 
you know, I was like thinking, uh, uh, pro- probably kind of like an, an anarcho libertarian or something like this. I'm like, fuck yeah. the government all the time. <laughs> this type of attitude. Um, and then Jordan Peterson makes me aware that there's there's something going on with uh, the world, the, the woke institutions, I guess you could say. And he makes me think about Christianity an awful lot more seriously. But then um, while I was making my channel and I was talking about Jordan Peterson, let's just say the people in the comments would constantly link very interesting videos. For example, you were linked to me in the comments at one point. Ah, and right, right. Nice. <laughs> that was the process. That was when I started to really uh, learn, like, you know, it was like, wow, the 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 whole world shifting, the whole the, the upside down nature of a reality. If you this way. So it happened actually yeah. through the channel, uh, through creating things is where I started to learn. Yeah, all right, cool. Yeah, I mean, my uh, my take on Jordan Peterson has basically always been the same. He has been a very good, I wouldn't say a gatekeeper, because ultimately the truly uh, curious guys, they will go further. So they will stumble upon his work because he has a great reach. And then the guys who want to, yeah, take things further in terms of their enlightenment journeys, uh, they will go further. So the guys who aren't so curious, they might stop with whom, him and take his worldview to heart but the guys who are truly high thumos they will go further so i haven't i have never viewed him as a as a gatekeeper in that regard uh, but more like a a first step on um on a much higher ladder so he has a good starting point i would say then again you know it's it's sort of like seeing you know if you have an old fighter an old ufc fighter k1 <laughs> fighter or something that you know you grew up with being really good and you admire him and then he gets a bit older and then he starts losing and he doesn't know when to quit Mm -hmm. Uh, but you still sort of respect him for his um, prowess when he was a bit younger and that's how I see Jordan Peterson a bit now as well when he talks on Twitter about um, I don't know what he says but these anonymous demons who are commenting on his Twitter post and YouTube comments and uh, he wants everyone to he wants no one to be anonymous and stuff like that so he's sort of uh, he's sort of losing the grip but I still respect him for for the work he has done and uh, yeah I mean bringing bringing a lot of this um, matters to light yeah like with Jordan Peterson I, I can I guess I can give my thesis on it um He's he's like he's the, he's the apex boomer consciousness, you know. Like he has a fantastic um, hard line, and he's like, all right, let me maybe put it this way: he's he's very good at talking about things that an awful lot of people do actually lack. Like he's very good at asserting a brutal realism and the need for things like responsibility and the importance of understanding that if you want to actually achieve your goals, you're going to have to take this like very specific, down to earth, procedural, responsible approach to this stuff. He was a huge deal for mainstream streaming um christianity and a, a a alternate a sophisticated alternate perspective to the the worldview he sort of intellectualized and made it more sophisticated to believe that you know there's a reason to be conservative there's a reason to be christianity uh, to be christian i think those two things are so important because what was dominant before him was you know the the new atheists and sam harris and all these type of things and yeah i do think that stuff is incredibly important and it's really like taking things many steps forward and like if you read young in any way you like young would generally say that's just it's so essential to do stuff like that to stabilize people's imagination from being caught up in communism and stuff like this so he's done he's done phenomenal work in setting up a trench against you could describe as like a full communist takeover and it sounds very extreme but like if you actually think about it at that time the actual threat was like every our our red pill views were all very young and they weren't going to go anywhere anytime quick but yeah. he was setting up this like really firm back he really put the foot down when it mattered you know and now what you're seeing is that an awful lot of people are are starting to like a lot, enough, a lot of people are starting to look at these woke movements, if you want to call them this, and saying that they sound ridiculous. Like there is actually a huge popular dis, dis, uh, disrespect to them that was not there about five years ago. Elon Musk, for example, likes Jordan Peterson and, and follows mm. his circles. And I, you know, I think his circles are very suspicious, but nonetheless, you got to look at a win and understand a win. And Elon Musk has basically gotten red pilled by Jordan Peterson and his uh, those type of characters, and has now bought Twitter, one of the main media arms of the the, the world. And he's now starting to twist it in that direction. Like that's a that's a phenomenal win, you know. That's a ph- phenomenal achievement, and really uh, puts yeah, it is. It is. To Elon Musk, if you're listening to this, thank you for buying Twitter and thank you for unshadow banning me. I was shadow banned, <laughs> I think, for I don't know four years or something like that. I had no reach and I, I didn't grow my account. But now, over the last few months, it's actually gotten you know interactive again, and my account is growing. So uh, great stuff. Thank you, thank you, Elon Musk. 
So I thought we could get into the truly juicy, the juicy stuff, the juicy topic. Always, if I want to provoke a discussion, a heated discussion, I always throw out the following topic, paganism and Christianity. Oh. And I saw that you have, um, uh, yeah, you went on a, or a really good, you made a really good video. Uh, I will, of course, link your channel uh, below in the description box here. And I encourage everyone to look at, I think, your latest video. It's about what if Christianity was that time's uh, woke movement and it details, of course, the um, yeah who Christianity uh, was for. And uh, I will let you elaborate a bit on this. I will just give a shout out to one of my best and truest. Shout out to Natty Pete. Uh, Natty Pete is a good friend and he actually, he was the one who recommended your channel to me. And this was maybe a year ago or so. Now, fun part is that he is actually a Christian. So uh, I'm using this as an opportunity to some good old banter between us. So I'm bant smaxing my, my good friend Peter by by having us uh, bashing Christianity here. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we can go. We can give it. We can give it a trouncing if you want. You know, we can, we can really dive into that. I think Jordan Peterson is a brilliant paradigm to bring it up because um, there's a movement now where like Christianity is is really coming back strong among yeah. you could say the dissident perspective. And generally speaking, so like first caveat on top of this, like let's go, just go into Young before I really dive into it because we will give this a serious battering. Mm. Um, the first caveat is Carl Young, some dude I really really like, and Jordan Peterson obviously read him to the depths. And Jordan Peterson is basically the prophet of Carl Young. Jung basically says that um, we have our, our, our psyche, you know, we have our minds. And within our minds, we have this um, structure. And within this structure is, he calls them the archetypes, you know, but we have all these, these, these stabilizing forces. And at the very center of our souls, our psyche is the self, he calls it, the throne of the self. And Jesus Christ sits on the throne of the self for European people is what Jung basically asserts. And the idea that if you betray Jesus Christ, you betray yourself. It's very, very dangerous. If you try to get rid of Jesus Christ, you open yourself up to all sorts of like bewitchment by the most absurd and crazy things. And so Jung's basic argument is that the reason why communism or the reason why the 20th century was so bizarre with so much like emotional, impulsive psychopathic movements is because people were thrown away Christ for this sort of nihilistic death of God era and all sorts of like different gods were swooping in and taking control of the 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 psyches the the, the psyches of people and bewitching them so this is this is Jung's basic idea um now of course you may disagree with that and there's plenty of ways you can disagree with that but what Jordan Peterson does is he stands up and he reasserts that sort of Christian ethos and Christ himself in some sense and this stabilizes an awful lot of people as I said in resistance to the woke movement now, I always found that very interesting, but then there's always something like Nietzsche, the fucking scoundrel, always <laughs> left this thought in the back of my mind that was itching at me, where Nietzsche is accuses Christianity of being the main force that is driving the liberal movement of the world, the, should we say, the delusional movement of the world. Maybe we'll get into Nietzsche's stuff specifically, but he, he is always pointing out in Christianity that Christianity is seriously full of problems. It's Christianity should not, he says this in the Antichrist, we should not deck out and embellish Christianity. It has gone to war against all higher men. It is the absolute enemy towards the highest, and it has done nothing but celebrate those who are weak, and it has made us botched and weak as a consequence. Like, these are extremely strong words. And I was well aware that Nietzsche is no fucking fool. And mm. I guess the best way I could describe this is to think about what, what is Jordan Peterson up here doing? He's saying there's a woke movement. There's these communists. The, the communists are back. They're a woke movement in the universities and they're trying to swoop into our institutions and brainwash us towards this 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 movement of equality where the the, the useless and the resentful are going to take over. And it kind of clicked to me one day. It's like Christianity was the woke movement for Rome. And this is not trivial. Like if you look at the historical facts, the way that that happened, the way that that movement took over Rome follows the same pattern as the way the slow march of the institutions happened in the West or the way that uh, the woke movement has gone into the universities. Like it started by appealing to the people at the bottom of Roman society. In, in some sense, you have to understand that it started out of the Judeans who had just been crushed by Rome itself. Rome had just destroyed their home, which is like an egregiously terrible thing to happen to a people. So of course, they're going to be upset about it. They're going to be bitter. They're going to be like they're cast out into the world without a home. They're now nomads. They're not going to be friendly towards the Roman Empire. And it's not like they'll forget about it anytime soon. Like this is like thinking the Irish forget about the fact that the English conquered them. No, you stay bitter with this type of stuff. And 
they the, Rome has was full of like it's almost like you know the greedy capitalists these days. Rome was full of all these these Romans who conquer these places and they want slaves. They want to like fuck a beautiful slave girl because th there was the institution in Rome. You could have your mistress as long as she was a slave and you had your wife and it's perfectly legal to to bang your slave. Let's put it this way. So they all they you know all Romans want a good looking girl and you're gonna have kids out of this. All Romans want someone to clean the floors. They need gladiators. And so Rome was a slave state. There was 30 to 40% of, I think, Rome towards the end was slaves. It was a slave population that they were ruling over largely. And they were harvesting all of the, the, the Middle East and pulling them all into Rome. And yeah. you, can even, you can even look at the genetics on this. I'm, I'm sure you've seen this, but Rome... Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like Rome used to be basically French, like sort of Gallic, French, Celtic blood. Then towards the peak of the empire, it was basically Middle Eastern. Because they were taking in so many slaves and maybe so many migrants and stuff like this. Then after the the probably the, the golden lions of their day swooped down and uh, conquered Rome, <laughs> the Goths they probably yeah. came in. Yeah, I actually I can uh, I can elaborate briefly on this. I will include a chapter on this in in my upcoming book. So basically, the the start of Rome uh, Latins. So they were of the corded wear culture from yeah France and Germany. So similar guys who went to. Uh, Britain and Ireland, same guys who went to Netherlands, Scandinavia, and also to later uh, Persia and uh, even India. So that is the original Indo-Europeans. Then, of course, over the centuries, uh, many bloody civil wars uh, in Rome, and of course, many wars of conquest. The uh, sort of noble lineages they uh, they went they went out and, and got replaced by immigration from. Uh, uh, south and uh, and east, uh, and especially during or after the fateful year of 212 AD, the Edict of Caracalla, uh, mm -hmm. and some say he did this to increase the tax base of the empire. But he made he basically made everyone a citizen, all men, all free men citizens. Uh, so therefore, even more people from the Middle East or Near East, I should say, uh, and Africa could come to Rome. And then uh, after the the Gothic and Lombard and Germanic invasions, uh, the Italy, the cities were sort of depopulated and the Italy, at least north of Rome, it went back to a more uh, Indo-European configuration. But you still have a quite big split between Southern Italy and Northern Italy in terms of genetics. So... Um, I think that um, a northern Italian man is closer to an English man than what he is to uh, a southern Italian mm -hmm. man. Uh, I don't know the exact study, but something like a particular place in northern Italy compared to uh, an Italian man from Calabria or something like that. So yeah, it was a big, big shift demographically in the the Roman Empire. And what I will say also in the book that the the Gothic uh, when all are exact Rome in uh, 410 AD, those guys, they were probably more similar to the founders of Rome than the inhabitants of Rome uh, that got sacked. So uh, yeah, it's um, important to keep in mind that the Rome of the early heroic Republican days, uh, that was not the same Rome that got, uh, got sacked later. As you mentioned in your video as well, by the way, you say that it was full of foreigners and they, of course, they could embrace Christianity that was not Roman. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, really, you have to think about this psychologically and you really have to use your imagination to put yourself back in this stage because it's like like thinking of the, imagine walking the founder, founding fathers through modern America. Like, they yeah. were like, <laughs> yeah. what the fuck have you done? <laughs> like, Jesus yeah. Christ. And it really comes down to this because, um, th th like, the native, this is where you kind of have to understand paganism. Again, Nietzsche talks about this. Maybe I'll get into this in a moment. But Nietzsche has this view of God. Like people think he's an atheist, but it's like, no, he he tries to model God in lots of different ways. And so he talks about actually the God of Israel. And he says originally these, these Israelis had this actually quite vitalistic, powerful God. But this is when their God was like a pagan Yahweh that was for them. Mm. And he was this, you know, Yahweh was the the, the god of, of luck and rain, and he was a punishing god. And um, in the Bible, Moses stands up and he says, take Jericho. And God says, yes, go down there, kill the women, enslave everybody, and conquer it. This is yours. And so this god is like clearly not the god that we're familiar with, the modern god we're familiar with. This is the, the vengeful punishing god, the god that Richard Dawkins says is like crooked and cruel and not really a truly moral lord at all. <laughs> and he, this, this god, uh, like Joshua follows him and destroys this country. And so what what Nietzsche is basically saying is that like a, a, a god 
is a representation of the the will to power, the vital energy of a collective of people. So the God of the Jews is is Yahweh. It's it's a it's a it's a collective focal point for all their will. In some sense, it's the living version of their spirit. If you think about it abstractly, so this is what Jupiter or Wodan. This is what these characters are for for us. Like you know, the the Jupiter or Deus or Zeus is the collective will of the the Roman people. You could even say the Mediterranean people, but we'll go with the Romans for now. And so Jupiter is this channeled expression of all this. And the Romans were extremely pious people. The word piety comes from the fucking Romans. Most of our religious words come from the Romans, obviously because of Catholicism. But piety, all these types of things. The Romans were incredibly diligent and religious. They looked at their success as a consequence of their religiousness and their piety. They had monogamy. They had all these type of things that people celebrate so much. That was all there, you know? And they were um, incredibly uh, like honorable to, towards their worship. And they they worship Jupiter and they saw the manifestation of Rome's success as almost like a consequence of them being honorable towards Jupiter, to, to worshiping Jupiter properly. Jupiter is a representation of their collective will, their collective spirit. But the thing is, is that how like if a foreigner goes in and worships Jupiter, that kind of doesn't make fucking much sense when you think about it. It's like, why would I worship somebody else's spirit? It's like cuckoldry, spiritual cuckoldry. And in fact, when the Romans would conquer a people, this is exactly how they would enforce this. They would cuckold the per- the people spiritually. When they conquered the Gauls, for example, they wiped out their their gods. They actually understood their gods, but they it, it asserted Jupiter as the supreme god who who's uh, who cooks all the other gods. And they did this to the Judeans. They went into to J- Judea, and they were sort of like, yeah, you can worship your fucking ya- your made up god Yahweh or whatever it is. But Jupiter comes on top. Jupiter will be in the temple. Jupiter is who you bow to. Jupiter is the because you have to acknowledge that we're better than you so clearly our will to power is superior so you're going to worship us first as the dominor the dominators but of course you can have your little gods around that that's no problem at all like we don't mind that in fact we we encourage that and they had an intellectual institution to explore that called uh, greco interprete or roman interpretato and um, the point being is that this schema actually kind of made sense is that you have the, the the vital almost ethnic god as the ruling dominating god to represent the the dominating people and then you had the other gods where it would have been put in different pedestals. Now, foreigners don't want to do this. People don't want to be cuckolded spiritually. You know? <laughs> so it's very hard to identify with um, with the, the native gods. It's very hard to identify with Jupiter. So if you build up a slave state that's 40% not those people, you are going to ha- you basically have an entire, nearly a majority that is not you. And this becomes a serious issue. So these people are not are going to like sit around and hang out together. They're going to have a culture together. They're going to talk together. They're not going to worship Jupiter. That's just absurd, you know. So they're going to sit down and say to themselves, "Who are we?" And they're going to sort of look for an identity. And of course, th- their gods have been long defeated. It won't make sense to believe them. But then we have this religion that comes in that's that's very universalist, that's very accepting of the lowest. It doesn't have this supremacy that it's like, well, look, you can't worship Ju- like Jupiter is the Roman god and the Romans are the aristocrats here and the landowners and the farmers. So instead, it's sort of like you're the city dweller. You have no destiny, no identity. The Romans have turned you into a slave, which is a terrible experience to go through. But so, and then Christ comes along, this Christianity comes along and it offers to them an identity and it says, look, even though you're a slave, even though you're nothing, you can, you can be one in Christ. Everybody, Christ accepts everybody. Christ loves everybody. And this is very similar to this woke minority thing that you're seeing nowadays, that yeah. we have the dominant, you could say the vitalistic uh, Woden or Jupiter is now representative actually of the Christian God for us nowadays. That's the, the Western God, if you will, in many ways. And then um, what's astounding is that the woke thing comes in and does the same description, just like communism came into Russia and said, listen, you downtrodden, you drunks, you alcoholics, you prostitutes, you people who you're not the Kulak and you're not the monarchy because they're just oppressive tyrants. They're evil. But you, you're, you're special. You're the comrades. You're the people who understand equality. You're the people who can instantiate the utopia. So let's all get together and let's take out these monarchs and reconfiscate the land off these Kulaks and set this, this, this whole project into a, a new, a new order, a new utopia that will work out. So Christianity comes in and presents itself exactly this way. It, it's the demographics are astounding. You, you see uh, Tertullian talk about this. One of the church fathers, he was from North Africa, and he talks about how Christianity was a urban movement of the bureaucracies and the, the the populations, which is where all the slaves would be in the cities, and the rural pagans were all 
the Roman stock and they were all pagan. You know, the, all the Roman stock were in the, or they were the aristocrats or the, the, the rural places. And they were all pagans. They were all worshiping the old gods because that's their ethnic god. And so these, unfortunately, these, they were stupid. They took in all these slaves and then they reaped a terrible whirlwind as a consequence uh, a couple of centuries down the line. It was like, you know, a short sightedness, if you want to put it this way. And, yeah, um, definitely. And uh, this... I just got to interject, sorry. Uh, uh, no, I need ahead. to interject with the, in terms of syncretism. Um, so I would say that since the, the other European um, pagans at the time, so in, in Gaul and in Britannia and the parts of Germania, today's Germany, Netherlands, they, they had the same deus pater, or however we shall pronounce it, but the, the original god, so Tyr in Norse mythology, a Germanic religion, uh, same as Jupiter. So you have the similarities that you can also see in ancient Persia and India. So I would say it was easier for the, the other Europeans to sort of merge into the Roman spirituality, whereas for the uh, Judeans and the Carthaginians, these people's uh, on the other side of the Mediterranean, I'd say that for them to accept Jupiter, it was a much, much bigger step to take. Whereas for a for a Celt in Gaul, it was only yeah, it's a very similar god to to their own head of the pantheon. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to to interject there. And that's a very interesting point, and like there's a lot of interesting historical things that I haven't quite figured out yet. But for example, the the Aryan um, Christianity that came down from the Goths, where they basically say that Jesus was not necessarily the Son of God; he was sort of like a divine mystic who who was bringing the the, the truth of of the world. Like yeah, exactly. So uh, there is one reason, and I think I am I'm paraphrasing Stephen E. Flowers here, one of my favorite authors, and he said that they did this. So the Goths, they embraced Aryan Christianity. So that's not Aryan as an Indo-European, <laughs> but Aryan as with a uh, Bishop Arius um, from Egypt. And yeah, as you say, uh, Jesus was not a god in their view, but they did this. They embraced this type of Christianity to get in with the Roman Empire by being Christian, but also they didn't want to be um, Catholics uh, or the mainstream Christianity of the day because they still wanted to maintain a certain ethnic separation between them and the population of the Roman Empire. So that can be used as to explain why the Goths, they went on a sort of middle way between, you know, cr still Christian, but not the exact same as the other Christians to keep that sort of ethnic distinction. But uh, yeah, they still went to Christianity, of course, to yet to gain in with that on the good foot with the with the Romans. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating thing to explore. Maybe we can get into it in a minute because it like it opens so many interesting questions. Like an awful lot of them just accepted Jesus. You know, they're like Jesus is this this great guy that all all of us worship, and they're like, sweet, we'll put him alongside Thor and the boys. And it's like this yeah. sort of <laughs> this sort of idea, and they're like, wait, what are you doing? No, it's different. It's like no, no, it's fine. He fits right in. Like it's fine. He seems really cool. Yeah, he reminds me of like whatever. So we'll stick him in there. But, yeah, um, and I mean that's how they did it as well. They presented Christ as a, a conquering hero, a conquering warrior. Uh, a king, a warrior king, that is how he was presented to these Germanic peoples. And uh, I did review a book review on my page. Everyone reads my book reviews, I am sure. <laughs> uh, I say that to guilt. I guilt trip people into reading my oh, book reviews because I know they aren't as popular. Yeah, yeah, I'm using some slave tactics against my followers here. Uh, but that's a really good book, at least. The, the early Christianization, the early Germanization of uh, Christianity by James C. Russell, if I get the title of the book right. But yeah, he basically details how Christianity had to reshape itself to fit in with the Germanic psyche to be more presentable to the Germanic peoples in, in the early Middle Ages. And it's like, I think what's so fascinating about this, because I was trying to draw it down to a first principle, is um this is very uncomfortable for people because this is... I actually think quite there's quite a lot of evidence for this. That this is there's there's this biological realism underneath what we might call ideology or spiritual or reality, and that's almost impossible to push out of the way. Another example of this I like to bring up with people is Northern Ireland. Like mm. there's states up in Northern Ireland that they've done genetic tests on that have been beside each other for maybe four centuries. Estates. We're not talking about villages. We're talking about estates. Mm -hmm. And these in these estates, one would be Protestant, the other would be Catholic, and they test the genetics of the Protestants, and they trace them. They'd be Scottish, basically, and mm. they test, test the Catholics, and they're all like Southern Irish, basically. And mm. th that's just that's just beyond belief 
how exact that is that the the culture obviously was like really in, in antagonistic but the point being is that the religion is a perfect perfect face or mask for uh, ethnic conflict yeah and you you see this when you look at the maps of europe you know like the the, the protestant revolution was a germanic revolution mm. the, the all, like all of the 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 gothic germanic all of the aryan christians you know that that's what protestantism was actually sort of looked like and um, Catholicism, like, it's so funny that Ireland's Catholic, you know, because the Irish, in some sense, we see ourselves as like more, we were akin to the Meds, you know, we sort of see ourselves as like coming from Spain and stuff like this. And we, we have this separation. And um, obviously, like, it's not that strict. We've blended with like the Normans, we've obviously blended with the English and stuff like that. But we still have that sort of legacy where we understand ourselves as a people from the South. And um, you see this, and you, you, you realize that it's like, all right, Catholicism, is Ireland, France, uh, Spain, Portugal, uh, Italy, all these type of things. And that's that's the Mediterranean world. Mm. And the Protestants are up there. Poland's a little bit of a fucking problem because it kind of sticks out <laughs> like a sore thumb. But then the yeah. Slavs are all Orthodox, you know? And yeah. you see, that's the that's the racial divide in Europe, basically. Med, North, and Slav. Slav. Um, and these things are just firm, man. It's, it's, it's bizarre when you see it. And so... Do you want me to continue going back into Christianity? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I I, I thought we could actually talk about the um, the beautiful and the lower spirit of Ireland, but we can get into that uh, after we, we. If you have something else to to say about Christianity, so we sort of wrap this up. I wanted to ask you about uh, another origins story. How you got um, sort of enlightened? How your first encounter with master and slave morality? If you have oh, any sort of like obviously. personal anecdote to to share. Sweet. Well, I think the yeah the the Christian Rome will be a very very good way to go into this. So, what basically happens is um again back to that Christianity thing like Tert- Tertullian and all these characters are um pointing out that the urban slaves and they've got their like savvy Vladimir Lenin type bureaucrats like like the church fathers and stuff like this. And that's qu- quite an egregious slander, but this is sort of the frame. These guys rile these people up, and then they very successfully penetrate into the the, the elites. They penetrate into the institutions. Constantine obviously um, uh, permits Christianity, and then it's just basically a tidal wave from there. This this huge slave state is just can't hold the Roman pagan religion anymore. It's like the death of the Roman Empire is happening. Christianity is like the woke movement that shows up at the end when the the mm. Romans have made their mistakes and become weak. Christianity is like their punishment. It's the symptom of their <laughs> their their failures and this type of thing. Mm. And so they have this communist revolution, of course. It's so similar to communism where they're like, all right, the utopia is going to come when we all convert, it, you know, be the kingdom of heaven. Everybody will be equal. Same principles in Christianity. We're going to take over. The kingdom of heaven will be achieved. Everybody will be saved. All this type of stuff. And of course, none of that stuff happens. 19 years after they ban uh, temple worship in Jupiter and they finalize Christianity and get its achievement 19 years later, like of, a, of an 800, nearly a thousand year empire, 19 years after they make this big conversion the fucking you know the golden the fucking golden ones of the day the the goths are charging in <laughs> conquering rome they're sacking rome and it's like you know how can you tell a better story than this this is exactly what you see the the tree shows you its fruits it's completely failed it was not it was not some type of glorious thing that saved everything an awful lot of people say everything went over east but it's like come on lads like let's look at the blunt reality here they they converted and got invaded like come on how more clear can it be (laughs) and you have stuff like city of god with augustine straight away afterwards trying to rationalize this stuff explaining how it's paganism's fault and you see all the same things as like after communism took over, there was a, the gulag, the, the Holodomor, all these horrible things happened. French Revolution, after that conquer happened, the reign of terror. It's this idealism that leads to delusion, which is actually masking something much more ugly, which is almost like resentment and, and even worse, ethnic resentment that's mm. going underneath it. And then once this gains uh, authority, what you, you realize something very, very quickly is that ethnic resentment does not mean organizational sophistication, does not mean competence. So those old Roman, Roman pagans won because they were, they, were, they were the creators. They were the, the strong, the intelligent, the, the organizers. That's why they, were, they created this empire. These people who ethnically resented it, or these people who just resented it all, all over, they don't necessarily have the organizational skill to set up a new Rome, even though they'll say they do. And so when they conquer Rome, it just falls apart and it's just uh, it's just a complete collapse and this actually tells you an awful lot about the nature of master and slave morality is that it's it's bitterness it's envy it's saying i can do a better job if you just give me power i'll make it more equal i'll make it more free whatever and then they get power and then it just all falls apart because they have no fucking clue what they're doing um, <laughs> yeah so that kind of yeah maybe that'll be our bridge into this 
Yeah, certainly, certainly. Um, so yeah, I I posted uh, yesterday, St. Patrick's Day. I oh, thought yeah. it would be a good day to to share uh, an excerpt from my upcoming book, where I talk about. So the chapter itself, it's about the the higher and lower. Of course, heavily influenced by the teachings of Nietzsche, also my own enlightenment journey, sort of when I began to understand master and slave morality, and when I began. Uh, mainly during my fitness journey. So this was actually before I encountered the the sensations uh, before I began to began my metapolitical journey. But it was only yeah maybe a few years ago that I could articulate it in a different way. So the uh, I noticed that uh, the my supporters were always like good looking, fit positive life affirming high thumos guys and all of my detractors were always of uh, like the the same style they're very wrong looking to put it to put it mildly uh but i noticed it and at first i was sort of i thought it was only myself that sort of presented it in that way that you know everyone who disagrees with me is wrong uh, but it was true i noticed it uh, so many so many times there were so many years so and then of course i understood that those who reacted negatively upon my online presence when i posted physique etc the guys with a master morality they could see it as a nice positive upli- uplifting good advice stuff like that and the the ones driven by resentiment, driven by slave morality, they would only see it as a as a sort of insult because they felt a bit inadequate in um, in response. So uh, so yeah. Anyway, uh, that about the chapter. But I I note also in the chapter that there are two uh, spirits in Ireland, two Irish spirits. You have the the beautiful spirit, which is sort of it expresses itself in Irish art, Irish music, Irish beauty. Even the land itself, Ireland, is uh, very, very beautiful, has a magical vibe to it. Uh, and then you also have the lower spirit, which is also very present in the United States. And that spirit, it sort of orients itself against the Anglo-Saxon higher. And uh, then you have that sort of conflict in Ireland today as well. And I can see it as well in, you know, there are, there's a lot of things, a lot politically going on in Ireland at the moment and I see these two spirits you know almost side by side you have one driven by an actual love for Ireland for Irish bioculture and that is the beautiful spirit and then you have the sort of resentmental spirit driven against uh, an aversion against the English so uh, yeah since you are checking in from good old Ireland from the Emerald Isle I thought to ask you if you if you have any take on the matter yeah, well, this is actually my opportunity to demand uh, reparations for the Vikings stealing all my books. Um, so this <laughs> is, this is, uh, I have hidden them away in my arcane library. I'm sorry. No one will get them back. We have a lot of Irish manuscripts and we have the silver Bible from the Czechs in, in Uppsala. So, But uh, yeah, we need to keep them for esoteric purposes. Well, I'll just send one of my, my UPS drivers up here. You can just pop them in and send them back and we'll call it even. Maybe maybe with a couple of million dollars on top of it as well. I heard the <laughs> in America they're they're getting some reparations planned where they're going to give them like $500,000 each or something like that. So I'm kind of like in that ballpark, if we can call it even. If we can oh, it right, out. right. Okay. <laughs> but um, I, I think this is, yeah, like it's it's very interesting me reading Nietzsche. Nietzsche was almost like uh, the, the vaccine for slave morality, you know? So I read Nietzsche as an Irish guy and... It's like, it's so funny because, you know, you, you always want to be the good guy. And Nietzsche's basically framing the master as, in some sense, like quite good. And then you read this and you realize, oh, my God, I'm, I'm, I'm coming from a slave population. Fuck, what's going on? <laughs> Shit. And I notice resentment everywhere. You know, I, I read yeah. through it and I'm like, oh, man, this is like we're, we're not dealing with master problems. I put it this way. And of course, it's it's very it's very like down to earth and logical. Like people do struggle with this theory a lot. But just think of the relationship between a winner and a loser. You know, like that's the simplest one you can imagine. So um, in sports, you know, think of a, a, a boxer like why does he win like he might have genetic talents that make him better than somebody or maybe we could say a school fight to make it more in the real world so there's a guy and he's like grown he's big and strong his mother you know fed him proper milk his dad taught him how to fight his dad made him assertive and confident and this guy is the jock he's the chad and if you think of like american pie or something like this he's like the the guy in the football team square jawed blonde 
tall, these type of things, broad shouldered. And his experience is very naturalistic. He's not very, like, he doesn't have to think through what he is. Instead, his experience is very much instinctive and passionate. He's he's good with girls because he, he's he's always been good with girls. He never had to, like, figure it out. He never had to go and learn game or anything like this. He's um, good at sports because he's a specimen. Like, he never, it was something that just kind of came natural, natural to him. Like, he's just built well and stuff like this. And this guy's experience is quite jolly and quite happy. He's usually very, very friendly. He might be like, you know, maybe he can push people around a little bit sometimes and he can be a bit aggressive or, or crude at times or he's like overconfident at times. But it's it's very well-meaning generally. Like he's, he's quite light in his spirit. He's quite funny. He's quite um, sometimes even a little bit shallow, but in a kind of like funny, bombastic, nearly cute way, if you want to put it this way. This is the this is the winner. You know this type of archetype. You know this type of character. He's, he's happy-go-lucky. He's successful. Everything goes his way he's strong he's mighty he's attractive the girls love him like this is you know what kind of people if you think i think i heard andrew tate say this it's like if you were up with god and he was like make your video game character which would you choose an ugly person or a strong <laughs> badass person it's like of course yeah. you're going to make it easy on yourself so this guy is kind of like favored by the gods if you want to put it this way now there's also these other dudes the nerds the the, the loser the, the geek who's in the high school and he has had none of these things. Maybe his his mother um, was a smoker or something like this. And so he was frail. He grew up weaker. She, uh, he didn't get fed as well because his parents weren't educated on the danger of soybean oil. And so he was like, you know, or they, they got into veganism or something like this. And so he becomes decrepit. He gets slacked jawed. And then he grows up and his parents can't discipline him and teach him to like avoid video games. And so he starts to get like video game hunch neck. And he's, he's turned into a bit of a fucking loser. He goes into school and for, for all these physical reasons, he's bad at sports. He can't hang out with the boys then. So he's stuck by his lonesome. Then when he like looks at all these beautiful blonde girls and stuff like this and these Stacys and they're like beautiful, sexy young, young girls like running into their primes. He's looking at them like, oh, my God, I wish I could have one of those. But he can't because they kind of look at him and compare him to Chad, I guess. And he's like, this guy is terrible. And so this guy's experience is actually quite horrific. Now, of course, there's a problem here because the reason why it is is because of like terrible choices decades beforehand, which are like this is sort of Nietzsche's idea of like, how do you actually save people like this from suffering? Well, you actually have to help them develop themselves properly. And the more you can do it at the root of their lives, the better. But we'll put that aside for the time being. This this dude is, is botched. This dude is, is unfortunate. He's not well turned out is the phrase that Nietzsche often says. He didn't turn out well. It's absolutely brutal. Mm -hmm. But this is the consequences of ignorance in these topics. So, so this is what you get. Now, what is this guy's psychology like? This guy's psychology is going to be a combination of self-hate. He's going to have the same sexual urges that Chad has, but he can't express them. Now, this is terrible because all this energy is boiling up inside of his loins, if you will, but he can't fulfill it. So it circles around inside of his body and it attacks him. It becomes, it goes to war against him and it might make him hate himself it might make him want to hurt himself he, he might become depressed you know like pent up energy he becomes depressed he becomes anxious he like goes into the mirror and he looks at himself and he scratches his skin he says i hate myself i'm so fucking ugly and stupid and useless and he might look at the chad and he might say oh fucking that dude like i'm he's, he's resentful he's bitter he's got all that desire for the the good looking girl but he can't have her because this guy this guy's like fun and laughing and you, you know you'd feel that kind of feeling you'd be like fucking i don't like seeing him win because i'm not winning i'm not help, uh, happy hmm. and so he has this this energy inside of himself and it's a very very dangerous thing very volatile very powerful as well it's like anger it's frustration it's a, it's a lot an awful lot of things now this is where Nietzsche becomes a profound psychologist because he's basically explaining to you that with this, what you're experiencing is very normal. Envy is extremely normal, extremely useful. In fact, if you interpret envy properly, you will understand that envy is your soul or your, your energy or your will telling you that you see something that you want. This nerd looks at Chad and says, I want to be like that guy. In some sense, the, the virtues that Chad has are things that I need to learn. So this is like, you know, hit the gym, uh, become more physical, take control of your destiny. This is what this, this loser could learn from this situation. He could realize, fuck, I'm a pencil neck dork. Let's change this shit. Let's go start smashing back the whey protein and getting bigger, badder, and stronger. And maybe in like two or three years with the help of like puberty, he could actually be on the football team and he could be living, he could be one of the boys high-fiving this guy. And this would be, you, you could say, a very heroic reaction to a bad situation. Like a, a slave, a failure, a loser can definitely turn turn a situation around. There's no there's no destiny really in this stuff. Like it's 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 really like up to you what you do with this. So when you get hit with these bad situations, the nerd can change change the situation. But of course, 
It can also go in other directions. It very, very easily can. The nerd can decide not to do that. He can sit down and he can think to himself, I hate this Chad, but I want to fuck Stacy. I want her. I need her. And so he can get riled up and he can sort of say to himself, I'm never going to be able to be on that football team. What can I do here? You know, and this is where, again, it could become a little bit creative. He might come up with this alternate lifestyle. He might become a, a, an artist. He might start playing guitar. The Chad will never be able to compete with him as the sensitive young man artist. So that could be his winning play. Or he might do all sorts of things. But these strategies, he can be, become a poet, become an intellectual, whatever. But these strategies can also go quite wrong. They can do things that are quite interesting, but also a little bit distorted. So for example, this guy might come up with this very crazy idea of like, all right, I need to be around that girl. I can't uh, present this masculinity because I'm not masculine. So maybe he would like, I'll pretend to be a gay guy. <laughs> so I'll like, you know, when I'll drop my hand, I'll start getting the voice on. I'm like, oh my God. And then I go to <laughs> Stacy, and I'll be like, your hair is like so gorgeous. And then he'll start hanging around with her. And of course, deep down, he still wants to be with her. He says, oh, I actually knew a dude in, in my, my high school, my secondary school that was like this. It was hilarious. Like he was very flamboyantly gay. He got in with all the girls. And then the story got out that he was like, you know, he'd get drunk with them and then he'd basically have his way with them all. And I was like, what the fuck? Like how, what is going on? So he, this, this, this strategy, you know, you see it before. But anyway, this, this dude, he's, he's hanging around with her and he wants her. And so he might do stuff like slander Chad. He'd call, he'd call Chad. This is where you're seeing this idea of slave morality happen. Slave mm -hmm. worldview happen. He's saying that everything the chat is is bad. Athleticism is is barbarian, and the way he, his confidence is 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 low consciousness. His um his bombast, his 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 beauty is like crudishness, is is laziness, is is cr is mean. He you might say he's like so toxically masculine. I'm sure you've heard that before. You know, he doesn't <laughs> understand women's realities. Whereas me, you know, I'm very sensitive, so I understand this stuff. And maybe Stacy gets bewitched by this. Who knows? And then she starts to fall for this guy, and and maybe she she like he starts getting second thoughts. He might even begin to lie to her about Chad. He might say, "Oh, Chad's cheating on you" and stuff like this. And this causes this divide, and then this guy ends up being able to pull Stacy away from Chad, at the very least ruin their relationship or maybe even get her for himself. And so you see this, this operation going on here is the psychology of a loser and a winner and how it can go from positive to toxic. Um, now, if you have any thoughts on that, we can pause it there or I can run into Ireland and England. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's a perfect way to explain it. Uh, I think that's great to frame it in a context uh, which I have seen this sort of reframing of uh, good and bad quite a lot is just you know physique posts because when whenever you see someone especially you know a beautiful fitness model guy a young european fitness model being posted physique and then you see the comments there and this is something i saw a lot early on as well uh not about me but just you know famous fitness models and stuff like that and you see the comments are is full of Guys, mainly, of course, saying that, you know, uh, how good is his cardio? Like, who cares how good his cardio is? It's only <laughs> a way for them to be like, you know, I, I need to comment something to feel less bad about myself. Or someone says, oh, I bet this guy couldn't last 10 minutes outside in the wilderness. Or some other guy says, oh, I bet this guy can't fight. Or then a fourth guy says, oh, this guy's muscles, uh, they're only for show. So you have all of this. Uh, slave morality reactions where you try to reframe the beauty of the fetus model into something that is actually bad so he's actually he's actually shallow and he's actually um stupid he's actually unmanly he's actually not a good fighter because uh, some reason and he is boring because he spends time in the gym and these guys who say this they are of course spending twice the amount of time watching netflix on the sofa uh, eating bad food so that was sort of a, uh, an early um, slave morality observation on my part that how just a beautiful fitness model guy could trigger so, so much hate uh, by just existing. I think that's a, like such a brilliant way to illustrate this. And I guess you could say a practical way it shows up because like understand this psychology. It's so important to understand this, to really get a good grip on what Nietzsche is saying. There's something in human nature that hates success. Like we, we have a deep seed towards success. And it kind of makes sense because if you're not the success, if you see somebody else winning, that's almost never really good for you on some level. You know, it's like, you know, it's not, it means you're not winning. Like if you're watching someone else win, it means you're not there. And that's mm. never going to sit around, right with your soul. Your soul always wants to be a part of it. It's like you, people all know this in like sales, FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. 
oh, I've got like this brilliant product or I've got Bitcoin and it's going up. You better get on tour. People don't want to miss out. So seeing success means somebody's getting the girl. Like these things are actually very binary in nature. If some guy is like getting the girl, it means that he's going to use that girl's womb for nine months to make his progenity and you will not. And that's very dangerous in nature. And so we're wired to be deeply triggered by this because nature actually wants us like lions to go up and fight that dude to make sure that you're the one that's breeding with the girl, not him. And so nature makes you you aggressive towards him very, very naturally. And so there's this natural instinct to dislike success and dislike um, achievers and, and, and be envious towards this type of stuff. Of course, people can misinterpret their passions. People always misinterpret their emotions because their emotions are incredibly complex. So when, so when your emotion screams envy at you, it's very easy for you to distort that and turning it, turn it into a rationalization or an excuse. This is also a part of human nature. Instead of saying, fuck, I should go and compete against that guy, you'll turn around and say, you'll try to rationalize that he there's something wrong with him. And this is where you start getting into this very, very dangerous type of morality. It's like what I was describing with the gay guy. You distort it too much and you start to go into, um, like you start to falsify the way that the world works. So for in this instance, a beautiful fitness model, you're doing this egregious thing where you're saying like, oh, he's not that beautiful or he's a bad personality. You've heard this type of stuff or even more petty little things. It's like he doesn't know jujitsu or a power lifter saying, well, you know, I'm stronger than him. And it's like, yeah, bro, like, but you're, you're just trying to demoralize this guy because you're not him. And like, you're clearly yeah. seething about something, this type of thing. And what you're do- this is what's so dangerous about this. This is why it's bad is that in the process of rationalizing against the beautiful, the high, the triumphant, you're actually devaluing that in and of itself. This is truly, I think, the essence of slave morality is that there are beautiful things. There are objective, beautiful, successful things in the world. They're like our goals. These are the things we actually want. And if you come up with some type of resentful rationalization to say that they aren't valuable, you're, you're, you're on a very fast track to something bad. Like if you say, oh, bodybuilding's stupid, because maybe you got bitch mad about some fucking physique poster, golden one on a boat saying that I'm coming to steal your books or something like this, and you get mad about it. And so you say, I'm going to be a power lifter from now on. And then you you get really fat and then you do nothing but eat, overeat and then lift weights and all this stuff. And you say, like, I'm a big man because I can lift heavy weights. It's like, well, wait a second, bro. Like, you've made this hugely emotional decision. You've basically gone completely against and you, you might have even fucked your joints up in the process of all these types. Like, you know what I mean? Like, this can actually lead to mistakes. Mm. Same way as like, a, a, you know, some some fighter who's trying to prove he's a tough guy because some bodybuilder got the girl. And so he goes and he, he goes hard boxing and ends up getting like, you know, too many concussions from sparring irresponsibly. And then ends up with like uh, actually an issue because he was just trying to prove to himself he's a tough dude because some guy took his girl when he was like 16 or something like this. It's like, Mm. wow, like look at the kind of cycle of relationships or a bodybuilder can do the same thing. Some boxer can like look cooler than him and he can try overcompensate by going on roids and end up like fucking up his hormones or something like this. Like like, these are maybe specific examples, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So in relationship to between people, first of all, would you like to say anything on that? And then I'll go into the Irish and English. Yeah, no, I think that's a good segue to the Irish and English. So with the Irish and English, like this dynamic plays out between tribes. This is where things become quite shocking, quite difficult, because I would argue, I would point that I'd say if you went to Rome during early Christianity, you would find much, many of these phenomenons happening. You would have like these, these slaves resentful towards the, the Roman conquerors and the Romans would have been beautiful, aristocratic and the slaves would have been unfortunately very botched because they were slaves. They would have been like, you know, had the worst food. They would have been the underclass. They would have been the people who they would have been slaves. They would have been like, uh, you know, hurt for centuries. So they would have had this natural resentment towards the Romans. And, and this is the kind of danger of a communist movement or a slave movement and all this. Now, this relationship between tribes is very, very scary because but it's also probably Nietzsche's most sophisticated and important a gift, I guess, to us psychologically, because he comes up with a way to categorize why weak people, you could basically say like left wingers, <laughs> are are one of the most dangerous <laughs> sources of, of of evil in our world, if you want to put it this way. Evil is not obviously a word he'd use, but he helps us categorize why we should be seriously mistrustful of um, of people who are promulgating the the lower forces, if you want to put it this way, yeah. because they're actually at war with what is beautiful. And the great educational process that European man needs to go through is to learn to d- develop a, 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 a sort of a religious understanding of this emotional state. And we're going to have to go through an awful lot of pain to learn this. Communism for the Russians was their way of developing that immune system. Look at what had to happen to them for them to, to have it drilled into their thick skulls, that it's like you <laughs> cannot 
cannot let people just bullshit you into these situations because they will destroy you. They will rip your skin off in public and pull your, your wife's pregnant baby out of her stomach because they hate you that much. You don't understand how dark hate is. You, do, you just don't get it, you know? And the same with the French Revolution. The French Revolution sounded beautiful, but when they achieved the conquest and they cut off the heads of the monarchs, the mask came off and you saw that toxic nerd resentment popped yeah. out of them. And they went around and they butchered people, man. They they hunted down the Protestants and they made sure that those prods got fucked. They attacked. They were merciless. And it took Napoleon, a Superman, to come in and whip them into shape. Napoleon said that he was during this in the streets in um, France, he was he was tasked with controlling one of the mobs. And he described how that that kind of you know it read that was his red pill moment where he mm -hmm. realized that it was like a, a sort of a, a resentful biological phenomenon he was dealing with because um, these people were just like festering monsters they were just like there was like animals just attacking you know aimlessly there was just no it was just crazy you couldn't believe what he was seeing and so I know this because being Irish we are full of this energy towards the English because the English conquered us. The English put us underneath their foot. They, you know, they, they were involved in the famine that ended up starving us. They, they, these are really egregious things to do to us. This made us like worse off. It destroyed our genetic heritage. We had 8 million people and that got cut down to three. Like that's astounding the type of wounds you take off something like this. And we developed like a very, very uh, dark chip on our shoulder. In fact, the, the reason why the revolution happened was because of the famine. And what was going on is that we, we just absolutely despise them. We hate them. We, we like, we fuck these dudes. Like they, they're not our friends. They're, they're out to hurt us. And we have this like negative energy towards them at all points. And I, again, you can understand this. Like, it's like what I said with the, the slave, the nerd, it's okay to feel angry and envious if you're going to use it as motivation to make yourself yeah. better. The, the Irish sort of maybe used it to get their nation back. And it's like, all right, well, what are you going to do with this nation now? And it's like, we're going to turn it into EU global homo thing. It's like, you fucking idiots, right? You're wasting no. that. <laughs> but the point being is that like, you can use it. And so maybe we got motivated to do this stuff, but there's always a danger. There's always a residual issue where you can start to demoralize what is beautiful, like I said. And so when I look at the English, this is what Nietzsche taught me to do. It's like, I can't just turn around and, and do what, us Irish people tend to do, which is we call them arrogant and we call them basically Sauron. They're like implicitly evil. Everything they want to do is, is short-sighted and arrogant and aggressive and, and unthinking. And they're, they're obviously guilty just by, on first principle. And they're, they've sort of got this like evil instinct inside of them that they're too stupid to understand. This is sort of the, the worldview we have inside of our heads about the English. And this is also a, um, absolves us of, of many things. Like the Irish don't have to turn around and be like, you know, maybe the English conquered us because the English were more sophisticated, organized, more serious, more diligent, more disciplined as a people as a whole, more idealistic, more, more like, you know, they, they created the, one of the biggest empires in the world for a reason. They had mm. many, many profound traits, but we don't want to acknowledge that stuff. Now it's interesting because we're in denial of that. We can't develop those traits because I am a slave who says, oh, everything the master Englishman represents is bad. What's interesting is that I can't turn around to my friends and say, let's get organized. Instead, it's okay for me and my friends to be drunk because we're little poets. We're the little poor Irish people who are just hanging around in our villages and the English tyrants are just coming to get us and they're just interrupting our drinking sessions. What terrible, terrible English people. It's like, well, maybe we should stop fucking being drunk all the time. We should sit down and think about how we get fucking organized. How do we actually run a nation that's idealistic? What, what, what does it mean to be beautiful and to be high and to be successful? Th those, like, think how much bigger the English think than we do. The English conquered the world. We just ba barely conquered our own island. And that was the, the horizon of our ambitions. And that's actually quite small. And this is the kind of problem with the pettiness of this type of slave thinking is it brings you down to a low level. So um, when, when I look at this stuff, I start to see the, the power in it. Like, first of all, as I said, that resentment motivated us to, to win our nation back. It created a very profound political movement that was very creative. But on the flip side, it also has this resentment that self-limits it that stops you from, from actually understanding what true high potential is, true, like the highest beauty that you could aim for. And this is where you, I think you need to learn to overcome that resentment and understand the consciousness of a, a true, a true uh, master, a true winner, because how does the Englishman think like the Englishman, uh, maybe not now, and we'll get into that now in a second, but the English, the, the conqueror, the Germanic conqueror, 
is not caught up with like if petty wars with his neighbor. He's thinking about like the biggest goals of all. How do I take over the world? How do I create yeah. the highest culture? How do I reach towards the very apex of the skies and stuff like this? That type of big thinking is actually incredibly profound and rare in the world. But that's truly what I think defines a, a, a conqueror, a master, a, a true winner in that type of sense. Um, so that's, I think, really important. If you have any thoughts on that, we I'll, I'll rock into maybe more psychology in there, but I'd love to see what you're Yeah, sure. Also. I'll just say the following that, so when I mentioned the, the beautiful Irish spirit and the lower Irish spirit, uh, they were, of course, present back in the day as well. So maybe a hundred years ago, you had a, um, a sort of cultural revival movement in Ireland as well with the GAA, so the Gaelic Athletic... Gaelic Athletic so- Association. Yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. Uh, And stuff like that, you know, revival of the language, revival of many of these beautiful things. So I would say that you had almost like two two spirits also working, and perhaps these two spirits went to war in the Irish Civil War. Now, I'm no expert in that particular war, but at least looking at the sort of build-up to the um, the war for freedom, you have at least the beautiful spirit. It is in there as well, you know, the 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 Irish uh, sense for, you know, being masters of their own destiny and using their own beautiful uh, things, which is, you know, language, culture, art, stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, just wanted to have that uh, said. Yeah, so this is a very interesting conception. Um, I think the way I I ground these categorizations, and of course, like, they're yours, so you can do what you wish with them. But I was saying earlier that you have a loser, and he feels envy. He gets riled up with emotion about his situation. He gets angry and frustrated. Now, he has a variety of different responses to this, you know? So as I said, he could t- pretend to be a gay man so he can get in with Stacy and falsify <laughs> and say the chat is not cool. Like, the chat is like a, a grug or something like this. Now, you, you could maybe argue that, that that type of, like, distortion is highly creative. But, but it's kind of resentful and it's a little bit dangerous. Or he could sit and he could be butt mad and play his video games and say, I don't even want girls. He'd become like a black pilled incel or something like this. Mm. That's also a possibility too. Now you could argue that these are, are very, very negative responses. Like these are responses that are not dealing with the situation well. And you could categorize that they're, they're the, like, as you're calling them lower. That's that lower resentful emotion. So this would be like the Irish man that's stomping his foot and blaming the English for all the world's problems and just like fucking angry and sort of saying, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make a Molotov cocktail or I'm going to walk into a pub, wrap a load of nails around in a in a cloth and drop it in the middle of the thing and blow off a load of like English women and children and, and husbands' faces because I'm just fucking angry. And it's like, that's, you know, that's ugly. That's disgusting. Like, mm. what are you doing? You're just like, uh, it's how, how can you do, this is terrorism. Like, how can you do something like that? That's, that's horrific. Yeah. But then there's better reactions. Like you can turn around and you can take the punch in the jaw and be like, these fuckers beat us. They were more organized, but we're, we're going to, we're going to fucking, we're going to write, we're going to compete. We're going to go and we're going to work and we're going to build ourselves up and come back. And in fact, this is what this Irish legacy movement you're talking about was like. Like, there's a lot of people who are like, if we are going to win, we need to know who the fuck we are. And so you had all these these poets spending this deep amount of time trying to fill out the Irish destiny. And actually, in fairness to the English, there was loads of like Anglo Protestants, like Yates and all this that were huge contributors towards this. And um, these guys were like creative. They're like, you know, we're going to get organized. We're going to build our own uh, our own sports movements. We're going to work on our language. You had these people making great sacrifices to be creative and this creativity actually is what worked like we created such a powerful identity we have one of the strongest identities in the modern world maybe rivaling like the jews of the of the the white people i guess you could say which is interesting because both slave populations nonetheless the um we we go and we we transform we build we create and we focus that like that aggressive energy on building and creating and even like it gets violent as well like that the nationalist movement was in some sense a politically creative act like you know it's it's in that way but in some sense it's it's that was that was big thinking like we were taking on the english military and the establishment like that's that's actually ballsy you know like you're fighting yeah. a a military like all right fair enough like killing some poor fucking woman in a pub is just retarded but this is that's that's blunt resentment with no aim like it's headless resentment but this is like all right fair enough that's that's a real rivalry you're actually you're actually going for the boys like fair enough a high five to you that type of thing mm-hmm. and absolutely that that sort of ascendant um honorable i would even call it heroic that spirit as you're categorizing as beautiful i think is wrapped up with that beautiful poetic instinct as well i think it's motivated from correctly interpreting the type of energy you want and just basically learning to think like a winner no matter the situation i really think is what it comes down to and and when yeah part of us had that you know and then I, i'm not sure how the, the civil war graphs onto this because that's more like petty politics 
but like you had someone like Michael Collins, who was just like an absolute master, like an absolute conqueror, yeah. so savvy, so well played. And maybe he, you know, like people were more idealistic. I don't know. I don't know. Can you really wrap that up with master and slaves? People like wanted the whole island. He was like very pragmatic and he knew what he was going to get. So whatever about that. But I think the core psychology that I'm talking about there is the absolute root of this stuff. So yeah, super, super interesting topic indeed. And uh, yeah, we're we're well over an hour and uh, it feels like we only scratch the surface of the this uh, topics. But uh, yeah, awesome insights. And I encourage everyone to subscribe to the great Uberboy channel. Watch all of his videos. I will link the, the link below. And uh, do you have any, any final thoughts you would like to, uh, to share with our listeners here? Okay, well, I guess I'll, I'll talk about the, the English because this I think this is a very, very important side of this. Um, so regardless, regarding the slaves and the Irish and the psychology of the Irish, I think that's important to understand. But there's another side of this that is the masters and what can go wrong with the masters because this is like Nietzsche being the psychologist. I think this is very, very useful. Um, the problem with the masters is that they can become a little bit naive. Think about when you're a winner. The jock is the winner on the football team. He might not realize what made him a winner because it sort of happened very instinctively for him. He might not realize that the nerd hates him. So he might not realize that this nerd is trying to worm into Stacy's mind and twist her brain and stuff like this. And so there, there becomes a problem with the master where he becomes quite naive, forgetful, out of touch. And this forms a very interesting relationship where the slave is way more crafty and way more intelligent and way more, maybe not intelligent, but way more like um, sly, like a fox type thing. Mm. And so, for example, with this gay dude who is like, brainwashing Stacy to hate the jock and, and categorizing the jock as all these evil things, the jock doesn't really have a defense against that because that's just so interesting and out of the ordinary and weird. It's not, it's not something that the instincts have a plan for, you know, that um, the jock kind of gets a little bit confused. He gets socially outmaneuvered, if you want to put it this way. Now, what you see with the English right now, what you see with the masters as a whole, because this this category with the English should, could be better understand as the West as a whole, because the West is essentially like a master people overall, and the co a colonial project as a whole. The fundamental problem, I think, going on psychologically in the West is the relationship between the conquerors and guilt and their misunderstanding of the conquered and their resentment. The Western people don't understand the the the, the black hate that people like the Irish have towards them, if you want to put it this way. Now, the Irish are maybe a little bit of a special case, but you see this in like the, the minorities and, and people in America, and you see this overall as this big thing. And so the relationship for the, the masters, the, the uh, uh, historical masters, is that they have this big feeling of guilt. They have had their w way of doing things, their, their master values have been critiqued out of existence. They don't understand the value of the way they see the world. They, they've, they've lost their master traits. They've been bewitched and they've fallen for it because they're a little bit silly and a little bit naive. And they've allowed themselves to be haggard with guilt. And this guilt has distorted their mind and turned them into essentially slaves. They've been cuckolded spiritually in some sense by this feeling. And they struggle to overcome this absolutely. And they it leads to them making so many egregious choices. They're not able to defend themselves. They're not able to guard their heritage. They the the, the resentment of the weak is categorized in their mind as a good thing. That is the most frightening one of all. That they don't understand the the the, the, the aggression of that's what's getting directed at them and stuff like this. This would be like an English person in Ireland, you know, thinking that the Irish are are. Uh, angels who just want to go and help them on all this type of stuff and it's like wait a second bro like you know these people are not happy with you at all and so the the thing i see going on in the west right now obviously is like america uh, the germans the the english the french it's spanish like it's everywhere is the guilt that's being haggard on them because of the the colonial project because of their their conquering in the past they're masters of the world in the past and this guilt, this one emotion seems to be getting twisted and leveraged to just drive them to destroy their entire legacy. And as a consequence, destroy everything that is beautiful and allow them to allow a, like a resentful sort of like woke communist revolution take place, which promises this ideal of equality and freedom. But of course, it's going to end up exactly like the French Revolution, the communist revolution, where it actually comes true. It will just be a mess, probably even a little bit violent or yeah. brutal. 
in some way and not lead to any ideals at all. It'll lead to a, a sort of darkening age and the project will have to start again from a lower st- um, place. So I think that's one of the best things you can take out of this Nietzschean perspective as the education that Western man needs to achieve. We have Freud as the guy who we understand as the foundation of psychoanalysis. It's a tragedy that that wasn't Nietzsche because Nietzsche's categorizations are so much more sophisticated and relevant to our age. Yeah, definitely. Beautifully stated. And this is, for everyone who's listening, take a moment to meditate upon what uh, Steph just said here. It's uh, of utmost importance to understand what is going on in the West today. And of course, if we're talking about generational knowledge, this is what perhaps all boomers, uh, this is knowledge they should have had. But unfortunately, they didn't. So uh, they let things fall. But uh, it is what it is. It's up to our generation to set um, the morality straight again. So uh, yeah, awesome. Thanks a lot for coming on the channel and uh, enlightening us with this uh, with this great insights. Not at all, my man. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And I, if there's any boyos listening to this, definitely give Mr. Golden Lion a follow here. He's um, a channel I've watched for ages. And as I said, like that positive attitude um, you you bring, man, is absolutely brilliant. The It's just like it's so pragmatic for people to engage in this idea that we we can do stuff. You know, like, it, again, this whole idea of like, oh, you're a loser. Because I think, to be honest, the the... <laughs> The demographic we come from is actually in quite a losing position in many senses. Like we're not in possession yeah. of the cultural, the cultural hegemony at all. And these things are like we actually are experiencing the experiencing the slave feelings, and we need to be very sincere about this. And we actually need to take the punch in the chin that like all slaves need to take. We can't sit around and stomp our foot and be bitter and resentful. We can't sit around and uh, blame. You know, we're sitting around there and saying all problems are a consequence of certain things and all these type of things. I don't want people to be in denial, but I don't want people to also develop this disempowering nerd attitude where yeah, you can exactly. just sit around being blunt in the theory cell. And like, man, again, the reason why I'm saying this is the brand and the energy you put out is an- antagonistic to that. And it's, it's root. It's extremely forward thinking and positive and you can, and can do, it's got that can do attitude. And I think that's such a big deal. You know, I think that's really, really important and should never be forgotten and is um, something that's often missing. Yeah, thanks a lot. It means uh, means a lot hearing that. And of course, yeah, I try to be completely immune to black pills and slave morality and sort of <laughs> low thumos behavior. So I'm I'm all for it. Just uh, to to just uh, embrace destiny. So uh, yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, again, I encourage everyone to check out Steph's channel. First link in the description box below. Thanks for watching. XXO, boom.